Hello, my name is Sally Herriot. I live in West Cornwall and I'm a lecturer and module leader on the archaeology degree with Plymouth University based at Truro College. The aim of this paper is to introduce to you part of my research that completed with the University of Bristol. This explored the processing and use of hides and skin in late prehistoric Europe. And today I am presenting part of this which examines skin-based materials before and after deposition in a peat bog. Understanding environmental nuances that enable organic material preservation can sometimes be complicated. Nevertheless, this results in distinct environments conserving specific materials. Peat bog environments have enabled a variety of skin-based artefacts to be preserved with perhaps the most dramatic of these being the human remains. Now, whilst it is commonly accepted that the human remains have had no preservational processing prior to deposition and are not referred to as leather men, the same cannot be said for other skin-based artefacts. You can see in this image that Krogan Man is wearing an armband, defined in the report as being made from waterlogged leather. On the right is the Clonbrin Shield, and I presented research at Exarch 2021 conference, pointing out that this artefact is also described as made from leather. My research questions these descriptions. Why should skin-based artefacts such as armbands, shoes, cloaks or shields all be considered made of leather when humans are not defined as leather people? These artefacts may simply have also been tanned by that same environment. This paper presents a study that explores prehistoric skin processing and peat bog deposition to determine if variations in skin-based material can be noted before and after deposition in a bog environment. And to consider the question, are all skin-based artefacts recovered from a peat bog environment made from leather when deposited. While numerous methods applied to green skin can result in practical materials, this study only made three. The simplest rawhide was cow skin with the hair and fat removed and stretched in a frame so that it could dry. Others were both deer skin, cured using either the brain or liver. You may be familiar with the brain-cured material, as commonly known as buckskin. The hair, grain layer and any fat is removed. They are then soaked in a solution containing either the brain or the liver. The excess liver is then wrung out and the skin is manipulated and stretched until it becomes dry. While this can be strenuous work, all three methods are easily reproduced using primitive technology. To examine the question, are all skin-based artefacts recovered from peat bog environments made from leather when deposited, a comparison between primitively processed materials and leather was needed. So leather was purchased from a tannery in Devon that processes all of its hides using oak bark. Four samples were prepared and cut to the same size of 10 centimetres square. To aid identification, the corners of each were clipped from left to right. Here you can see the brain cured, liver cured, rawhide and liver samples. A moorland site not far from Land's End in Cornwall was chosen. It was relatively easily accessed, but not in an area that was likely to be disturbed. As recovery was not assured, it was decided that two trenches were needed and two sets of material would be placed in each trench. The trenches were dug approximately 30 centimetres by 70 centimetres and 50 centimetres deep. It was anticipated that if samples in one trench were not recovered, then hopefully they would be from the second. With the understanding that commercial tanning can take between 6 and 12 months, it was decided that the first trench should be opened after 6 months. Once the corner of the trench had been excavated and the first sample located, the others were quickly recovered and each was placed in a labelled plastic bag with a little peat put to stop it from drying out. 
With all from the first trench recovered, it was decided to leave the second trench for a further six months, but it was finally opened 13 months after burial. This trench had become a lot wetter than the first, and the samples were harder to distinguish from the peat. Unfortunately, one sample was never recovered. Nevertheless, this still allowed a complete set from both the six-month and the 13-month deposition to be examined. The images here show the samples before they were cleaned. Each had the superfluous peat removed and then were placed in a shallow dish containing distilled water. This was gently agitated, the dirty water was discarded and the process was repeated until the samples were free from obvious peaty deposits. The image on the right was covered in roots and could easily have been mistaken for a lump of vegetation had I not known what I was looking for. Here you can see that the roots have grown through the sample. Once clean, the samples were placed on wire racks to allow them to dry slowly and when dry they were labelled, put into bags and stored in a dark box. The images here show all the samples recovered from left to right in each picture, leather, rawhide, liver cured and brain cured. If we look at these with the initial question, are all skin-based artefacts recovered from peat bog environments made from leather when deposited? And whilst obviously discounting the actual leather itself on the left, then for those that resided in the bog for 13 months, it would be difficult to offer any other description than they are pieces of leather. But is this because this is the material that is skin-based that we are most familiar with? So can we see any difference between these materials microscopically? And if so, is this still evident post-deposition? Pre-deposition samples, leather, rawhide brain and liver cured. The top row is the brain or outside of the skin. The row below is the flesh or inside. On the leather, you can see the pores where the hairs would have been. And on the rawhide, you can still see a few dark hairs. What is striking is that the leather and rawhide samples are very similar and equally as different to the brain and liver cured samples, which are more akin to a textile. These images could even be mistaken for a piece of felt. The images here show leather pre-deposition, then the two in the middle after six months and the two on the right hand side after 13 months. Now by 13 months you still have a scale-like texture on the grain side, but the flesh or inside texture has become open, much looser, as if the bonds between the fibres that have noted in the image on the left that give it a smooth appearance have been washed away. This slide shows the rawhide. Hairs can still be noted and the black lines in the top images. On the left of the bottom image you can see the texture of the skin fibre as the white flecks on the sample. This texture is evident in the six month sample but by the 13 months it's really difficult to see. It's very faint, almost ghost-like for evidence. This is the brain cured sample. I'm only showing one side of this material as it does not have a smooth grain like the leather and rawhide. Clearly the pre-deposition sample is very different in colour to the other two images, so the depositional colour change is obvious. Microscopically, the web-like appearance can be faintly noted after six months, and by 13 months, it can only be seen when the light is shone from below. Because of the similarity in processing, it was anticipated that the liver and brain cured samples will react to deposition in a similar way. The middle image shows the sample after six months, and evidence of the fibrous nature of the skin can be noted as well as the random strands half bonded within the material. But by 13 months, again, evidence of this is very difficult to establish. 
And again, there is only a faint impression of random fibres. This slide shows the brain and liver cured samples lit, lit from below. While some evidence of the fibre can be seen, it is faint, which implies that this that had the material been deposited for longer, you may not have been able to see it at all. This combined with the details previously noted sadly discounts microscopic analysis as a dependable method by which to distinguish between skin-based materials that have been in bog deposition for longer than a year, and that therefore an alternative method would need to be found. As noted, all the samples were 10 centimetres square at deposition. And whilst this was not considered small at the time, larger samples would be used in future research to support easier identification. This table details the size of the samples pre and post deposition. And whilst it was obvious when recovered that some had shrunk, it was only when they were dry that this was fully appreciated. Initially, it was anticipated that post-deposition, the samples may fall into two groups, tanned and cured, the leather in one and the other three materials together. But these shrinking results imply something rather different. The difference between the samples, both in shrinkage and degraded nature, is quite dramatic. However, it does not appear to be along the lines of tanned or cured, as originally anticipated. Although the evidence does allow for the material to form into two groups, it is with the leather and rawhide in one and the liver and brain cured samples in the second. This graph shows that well, and interestingly, it is the material that has gone through the most and least processing that are so similar. By processing, a plausible variety of prehistoric skin-based materials and observing them pre- and post-deposition, a better understanding of the bog's influence has become apparent. These results clearly show that the differences between processing methods can be noted both by eye and microscopically and demonstrates that bog deposition clearly alters them and sadly nullifies the ability to distinguish this difference. The, the shrinkage data notes a pattern over 13 months and places the samples into two groups. This grouping demonstrates the need to reconsider the cataloguing of a range of skin-based artefacts recovered from bog environments, as artefacts previously considered to be leather may not have been prior to deposition, as they could easily have been fashioned from rawhide, as in the case of the primitive shoes on this slide. The dramatic shrinkage and deterioration of the cured samples also demonstrates that while these materials may not have survived this environment long term, the ease of production makes it foolhardy to dismiss them completely, as they could clearly form part of a prehistoric organic material culture that is sadly missing from the archaeological record. Importantly, this study has strengthened the prospect that not all skin-based artefacts recovered from bog environments were necessarily originally made of leather, and that classification as such may simply be because we are most familiar with this material. Consequently, a discussion is needed on the possible reclassification of artefacts that are commonly considered to be leather. Thank you for the time on this today. Thank you for listening today and I'm happy for you to contact, contact me on either of the emails below.